Mr. Morris. It's 530, I'll call to order uh, the Schenectady Urban Renewal Agency. First item on the agenda is to accept the minutes of the May 29th meeting. Entertain a motion, moved by Mr. Riggie, seconded by or member uh, Porterfield. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? And it's the end adopted meetings for 2013, first and third Monday of every month. Thanks. It would basically just would like to follow the city council schedule so that we don't have to publish these because we're going to probably be having a meeting every two weeks to transfer properties. Good. So I'd just like to set the schedule. Entertain a motion to adopt a tentative schedule of meetings. Moved by Councilmember Perazzo. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Erickson. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 adopted. Next items, resolution 2013-07, transferring a series of 12 properties to the City of Schenectady. Entertain a motion to approve that. Or I should say to move that. I'll move it. Moved by Brucker. Do I have a second? Porterfield, all in favor of transferring these properties to the City of Schenectady, signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Resolution adopted. Any business to come before the agency? Seeing none, I entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved. Seconded. Second. Stand adjourned. Yes, me and Keep the record. Last the three minutes. Sure. Yes. But you were putting the pressure on me. I was going to go slow. Exactly. That means we each have five and a half minutes for each item. Now, is the under-transfer meeting this proctor's presentation? Do you want to do this first before we go to finance? Mr. Morris is here. Yes. Yeah, I just saw him walk in. Oh, can I have a page one, please, Chuck? Mr. Morris, you're up. Thank you. Thank you. I, um, I appreciate the time. Let's just go spend two minutes to talk about where we are with Open Stage Media, which is the public access side of the contract with both Fios, Verizon, and Time Warner. Um, you guys made the decision to ask us to run it as of January of two and a half years ago. Um, we very recently, two weeks ago, opened a new studio that we called the Digital Soapbox. We had a small one upstairs in our offices. We moved down to the street in that small retail space, about 250 square feet. That's just to the left of the entrances to the Carl Company that would lead to apostrophe. It's, uh, it's completed in that it's functional. It's not completed because, uh, yet in that we intend to put all three cable stations broadcasts on televisions that are in those windows. So actually people can see both what's being recorded and uh, what's being broadcast. As of about a month ago, we are webcasting two out of the three channels, the public access channel 16 and the education channel, channel 17. And January of next year, we'll buy, we've will budgeted to buy the equipment in order to webcast the government channel in addition. So at this point, two out of the three channels are available on the computer on live feeds. We also have uh, downloads, video on demand for everything, including all the government meetings. Um, we're recording per week between seven and ten productions, shows at OSM in that digital soapbox, plus the Schenectady Today show and a couple other shows that are in the larger studio that's in the lower level of Proctor's where the green market goes downstairs. Uh, that's a pretty flexible little space, but the uh, smaller studio has been growing in access. We'd like more people to be able to use it. They need a little bit of training. We have a training program for contact with the train program for people so that they can learn how to use the equipment to record for themselves. And we've also grown a small pool of producers who could be hired at, I think it's $20 an hour, in order to shoot and edit for people who don't want to learn or don't have a volunteer to learn the program for them. Um, our education program with OSM has grown remarkably. Every school district, to remind you, the tact that we took was that participating municipalities had to participate financially. And so um, at this point, Miskiuna and um, Rotterdam are 
participants with the city of Schenectady. Um, Glenville is not, nor is the village of Scotia. Uh, their citizens are not able to drop off stuff for broadcast, nor to use our equipment. So it's just the two participants plus the main sponsor of Schenectady. We didn't do that with the school districts in Schenectady County, so every school district is eligible to bring materials, and we've been working with them extensively. As school districts have had budgetary issues, like everybody else, often the media programs suffer, so you've not seen as much, if you watch Education Channel, as much stuff on the Education Channel as we would have hoped, but we are looking to grow that by um, supporting those districts with media instruction. We have a full-time media person at Schenectady, and I've been talking to two of the other school districts in the county about a similar arrangement. Um, I would say we are a little slower than we would have liked to have been, but very close to what we imagined doing. And with television and video changing rapidly, I think we have pretty much caught up with the way the world looks at things. You can now watch our stuff on an iPhone, on an iPad, anywhere. Um, and that's pretty cool. So a year from now, we'll be able to do that on all, all the channels. And that was all I wanted to tell you guys and um, ask any questions. Okay, questions? Thank you for the update. Okay, great, thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, move to finance. Call the finance committee for order. Uh, first item up, New York State Occupational Safe and Health Training Grant. Ms. Did you know? Thank you. What you have before you is a legislative request for the city to enter into a grant. It has recently received a, an award of uh, a grant for the third year for the New York State Occupational Safety and Health Training Education Grant. It's a grant through the Department of Labor, and that award was for $24,314. We received 100% of what we asked for, ratcheted down just a tad because the Department of Labor took into account all um, recipients and just prorated out everybody at, at the 100%. So this will be the third and we think the final year for this support. Is there um, any match in, you know, is it? It's a reimbursement. It's a reimbursement. And it's total, it, it will, there's no budgetary impact whatsoever. Whatever we spend will come from this grant. Any questions? Just, um, could you just kind of tell me a little bit about what the, so the safety compliance and ergonomics, can you just say a little bit about what the training will be? Yes, it, 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 every year it's a little different. It encompass work, uh, encompasses workplace safety issues as well as um, ergonomics and uh, does touch a little bit on workplace violence, but it's just basically expanding on the same topics that have been raised throughout the training and getting us up to a level of compliance and education. Thank you. Questions? A motion? So moved. Is there a second? Uh, Peggy's not here. Oh, Peggy's not here. So I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next one up uh, handling the multiple bids for houses. This is something that um, we kind of discovered last week at the council meeting when we have bids for houses and then there's multiple competing bids. So I really just wanted to have a discussion and, and see if uh, the mayor had some input and kind of ideas of, of how the process should be handled to make sure that, uh, you know, that not only are we optimizing our return and, and, you know, not leaving money on the table, but that we're treating everybody fairly. And so I uh, wanted to kind of open a discussion, see if the mayor had any thoughts um, on how we will do things going forward. Is, you know, is there any intent to change the process? So. Well, the council's adapted a process where I appointed a property disposition committee which represents the different departments that makes a recommendation, screens the uh, offers, and it comes to city council. The uh, prerogative is still with the city council. Uh, I think we're actually in a Good position where there is more interest in properties than we have had in the past. I've got a number of realtors uh, who are out 
they're approaching some of the Schenectady property differently than they had in the past. And so um, it's a little bit unusual. People are looking at something and looking to put more money on the table. And again, if the council wants to say, you know, we've done the internal review and recommendation, if you want to shut it off the Thursday when the committee uh, agenda goes out, we can do that. Or if you want to let bids come in, you know, we will adopt it uh, to whatever the circumstances may be. Right. I think, I mean, I'm all for having, you know, more bids. I think if you put yourself in a situation, you got, you know, an offer on a house, and then while you're contemplating whether you're going to accept the offer, another offer comes in, that's, that's always a good thing for the seller. Um, I think in this situation, you know, if the price, the offer price at the committee meeting is released or made public somehow, um, made public after the, the committee votes it, and then someone comes in between the committee and the council to, you know, counter on, you know, up it by a dollar to try to kind of take it away, it, is that going to, whose best interest is that in? You know, so is, there, is it possible to keep the offer price confidential until the full council votes? And then you can continue to accept bids, but I think it's tough once somebody makes an offer, and then the world knows what the offer is, and then someone can come in the next day and bid a dollar more. It, it, it throws, I think, a disadvantage to the person, the initial person that comes in. So. Well, um, then you know, why don't we just look at having a pol policy that says this is the cutoff date, and you know, we, the mayor gave a date the Thursday before, as opposed to you know getting. Um, it's the same day of where that we have to take a look at and make a decision. If we have a cutoff date, everyone knows what that is, and so that, that rule applies universally, and that there's no having to come back and then renegotiate something, and then no one's going to feel, we would hope, that, that maybe they get outbid because someone released information. There won't be their opportunity for that, because right. there'll be a cutoff date, and if your bid isn't in, then it won't be considered until there's another property that you want. Right. I don't know how we can keep some of this stuff confidential made the internal recommendation and it's the council's agenda so we're putting that out I think at that point it pretty much becomes public information. Yeah and just to address your issue uh, or your thought and I'm not arguing against it but in the real world a realtor you know let's say it's Thursday is the deadline and a realtor on Saturday meets for the first time with a potential buyer brings the person out and they come in with an offer on Monday that's several thousand dollars more. And there you don't have somebody who knew of the deadline uh, because the person, you know, there was no contemplated transaction uh, before th the Thursday. And I'm, and this is basically what I ran into last week where I felt an obligation to bring that offer to your attention. And if, uh, and in theory, the flip side is that if you say after Thursday you're not going to consider any offers for the following week, if you have already passed the uh, resolution authorizing the sale at a specific price, are you going to be upset with me for not telling you that? If you pass that resolution, you're going to give up another offer that's several thousand dollars more. Two things, and I agree with you. And the other piece is we don't pass the resolution until Monday night. Correct. You know, the only thing we're doing right now is taking it out of committee. You know, one suggestion might be is to recess the um, the claims committee in which we okay these, or whatever committee if it's in. Um, CD and P or whatever until the night of the council meeting and then meet at 6.30. And if there are any other offers that come in, we entertain them at that point. But we do not, you know, make a full um, voted out of committee. voted out of committee until that night. And it may not come up a lot, but at least we would allow ourselves that time and it would also allow those individuals who don't have the time during the week. It could be on a Saturday, it could be on a Sunday, it could be a Monday morning. Right. Um, it's a, you know, as you said before, it's a very good problem to have. 
But on the other hand, I think that you know we can make sure that we get ourselves here 15 minutes earlier to entertain any other offer that would be in the best interest of the city and the taxpayers. So that would be my recommendation. Um, when we have these homes that are up for um, approval, we adjourn claims for the adjourns DDP and wait till Monday night and do it then. That's a good thought. That's good. Any thoughts on how that would work? I do think we still need to have a specific time of day on Monday, though, on that Monday. Say, you know, they, they've got to be in by 3 o'clock or whatever. However much time you need or or to prepare the information for us at 6.30 or whatever. I still think, and then I think we really need to stick to that because um, it's, you know, in the interest of being fair. Right. There are properties that are coming forward, you know, again, without a clear recommendation from the property disposition committee. It's coming back to the council and saying, you know, should we go back and counter offer? What are your thoughts on this? So that there are some that are more dynamic than others, and that some that you think that you've got a firm offering, other people are expressing interest. In the, again, in the grand scheme of things, that I think it's good for the city overall because you know, tonight we're going to go through another group of uh, houses and there's more in the pipeline. So it's happening. I mean, not as quick as we all would have liked to, but it's now coming together in a manner that uh, will uh, get us to where we want to be. Mm -hmm. I only have one other comment, and that is, uh, I, and I don't know how this will work with the proposed plan of action, but I think one thing that also needs to be considered is not sometimes not always a thousand dollars or two thousand dollars, but rather someone with a proven track record for successfully rehabbing houses and being responsible and you know wanting to live in the city and current on their taxes and yes. you know those kinds of things too so you know you come to the table and it's like well this person bid eight thousand and this person bid ten thousand well of course we want the ten thousand dollar bid well maybe it's not worth it if, if it's not the right risk. person right. so and i don't know what that looks like if we're Having an you know a bid in the eleventh hour, and well, then we're we'll going like right checklist into the checklist off the bid. You yeah. know, yeah. we um, are trying to, taxes. to yes, no. do some evaluation of again who may have stronger financial and just a stronger skill set to be able to go in, take whatever the property is, and convert it back to something that uh, you know is on the tax rolls, it's livable, and something we're all proud of. And that may mean that we don't necessarily take the highest offer. Right. Going right. To, it's just one of the criteria that's evaluated, I think. You know, there's, there's multiple things we need to evaluate. Uh, going on what Ms. Perazzo said, I guess I have another question then. So if someone comes in over the weekend, how do we do this checklist and make sure that it's done in time for a Monday night meeting? Yeah, well, we're we're trying time. to go through that. And, you know, everyone, there's different variables so that... Uh, We'll try and get all those things in place so that uh, we have that information to make the decision on the Monday evening. And so if it's not, does that mean we won't take it on the agenda? We'll wait until we but, get and it And that's, that's the sole priority of the council. That yeah. is not, and I agree with you, and I don't think we should. If it's yeah. not there, then we shouldn't do it. Yeah. So we can put it off for two weeks. I mean, we can always you know, put it off for two weeks, you know, if we feel that there's more activity, right? Um, we well, can adjourn the council meeting and do it the following Monday. So we've got a couple options on the board. I think just at the end of the day, it's good that we're talking about it to make sure that, you know, we make sure that any, you know, nothing's to be perfectly smooth. This is kind of a, an unorthodox process, but uh, we want to make all our efforts to make sure it's there. And I think that's yeah. extremely important that we make sure that people see it as being a fair process and not weighted in one person or another person's favor, you know. I got my own personal thought, which you don't have to pay any attention to. But uh, <laughs> meeting every week, you know, half an hour before the regular meeting, I think is a great idea. In the world, in the real world, the realtors are out there uh, very aggressively working, and if, if we can shave two weeks off the process by having that meeting every Monday night, uh, that would be wonderful for our dealings with them. I just have one more question, it's probably for Mary. At what point in the process, Mary, are we being unfair to the buyer 
um, in entertaining other offers. Once you have um, accepted in your your this meeting here, I think prior today you accepted an offer. We we don't accept the offer until the night of the council meeting. Okay. Yes, I understand. It moves that. on a committee, right. but in right. essence, it's not accepted until we vote on it. So what I'm gathering from what you're saying is that you're going to collect all the offers and then meet a half hour early before your council meeting to make a decision. To move it out of committee. Mm -hmm. Based on the recommendations, obviously, of the city, right. who's so presenting these offers the to us. The disposition committee. Yeah. yeah. So if you have the, so what I think what would be once that once you do accept an offer in your council meeting, um, any other offers legally can come in until they're signed, until the attorney approval is signed. So once the attorney approval is signed, no other offers can come in. And I think that if you're going to do that, I think if that's done immediately and, and the mayor signs the offer and um, John signs the attorney approval, that deal is sealed and you're being fair to, that's where I see the fairness coming. So from a real estate point of view, you think this plan of action is a good one? I think it's a great one. Okay. Um, and understand that the listing agent, any of those listing agents, when they know the date of when those offers are coming in, they but an offer has to come in first. So if subsequent offers come in, they can say, if you're going to bring in an offer, you need to bring it in by this date or it will not be accepted, and, and that's the way it is. But the listing agent will have control over that, and they need to be informed of what your decision is. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussions, thoughts, ideas? I, I'm now a little bit more confused. By, so right. you're saying when the attorney and the mayor sign it, not necessarily the same night that we approve it at council? I would say that that Which may not happen as soon time. as possible after you make a decision, because then legally right. any other offer can come in. If you want to finalize an offer, that's the best way to do it. Well, I mean, I think... John Polk, if it's attorney approval, he would sign it after the council meeting, the full council votes. I mean, the problem is the committee votes, but it's only the three people that are on the committee that actually are voting out of committee, and then the full council votes a week later. Right. So if, if we adjourn the committee meeting to right before the full council vote, that gap where more things can come in is limited to an hour, right? right. <laughs> that, that and what space. I can do is, if there are multiple proposals, I can have a resolution for each proposal. And then the one that's accepted is the one that gets passed. The others are torn up. And the general procedure is you would vote, uh, and then Chuck has to do his ministerial stuff on Tuesday morning uh, to be signed by the mayor. And then three minutes later, the contract's going to be signed by both of us. So we could wrap up everything Tuesday morning following a Monday night uh, passing of the resolution. Good. Good. All right. Okay. Thank you. Anything else? Um, well, yeah. So this is then going forward because we have a situation currently. So, I mean, or, and I don't know if that's something we want to discuss now, or does it from here forward? We should be discussing it. Yeah. I mean, I think anything with current contractual, you know, negotiations, I think we can't talk in public okay. because it would be right. disclosing information to put somebody in disadvantage. Okay. So, but I think. Later when we go to the second session. Okay. But I think it's, it's definitely something we should consider as we move forward. Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn? So moved. Okay, I'll second. All in favor? Aye. We're adjourned. Carl. Carl. Okay, I call to order administrative efficiency. Uh, Mary Porterfield, call log. Yes, um, and Mr. Winkler is here. Um, November 2011, Mr. Winkler came to the council and talked about the call intake form that was going to be done where every call would get an ID number, we'd keep track of all incoming calls, who took them, and then what the ultimate end result was. And it was going to somehow be tied in with the new software. So um, I was asking basically for an update on that so that when people, you know, where we are with that and how we're moving forward, if there's a timeline, and what that timeline looks like. Okay. A year ago, or whatever, excuse me. What's that? Uh, a year ago, uh, I stopped work on it. Juan was working with me. Uh, because I found out that the 
unit system was going to have that capability. And we did not want two systems conflicting. Um, I don't know the exact status of the unit system, but I know we've got an update. Deb, do you have that information? Yeah, I can, I can tell you that the um, city is currently moving to the most uh, recent version that it can that will allow us to potentially look at buying only if it's called the work order module, and it allows the city to uh, track, to create and track work orders and online requests and complaints. Um, just starting to look at it now, not sure exactly if it's addressing what you're talking about, I think it is. Uh, it's more from the perspective of tracking work orders through, uh, through the various departments of the city, but it is also uh, described to be able to take care of complaints. The thing about this, though, is it would be the same thing that Mr. Winkler was referring to. It's only as good as if somebody gets a call that they immediately go in and, and, and log it. Uh, so we should, in a couple of weeks, be able to kind of look at this a little bit closer. This component does come with a cost that's rather sizable, so I'm not sure if it's where we want to go. Part of it too just becomes manpower. It's really three people that are assigned to IT. Kind of glue is one of them who goes at multiple tasks, you know, traffic signals, sign shop, other things. And so it becomes how do you prioritize things? How do you balance it? And we are looking at it, trying to kind of chip away at the edges. But at this point, it's not a top priority. The money just isn't there to do it. There's just other issues and bigger things that we have to work on. So, uh, in, in, you know, in the absence of this, is there like some other process besides, or is it just calling the mayor's office? Is that That's what people do. Well, but, yeah, um, but is, is there an underlying problem? <laughs> well, is there an underlying problem? Yeah, people say that they're getting calling, you know. And not getting response to their to their calls. Okay, so then they end up calling the mayor's office, and we'll follow up. Well, if there was a process, then it's easier to tell people. Here's the process. You call here. There's the form, and you know, then you know, it would be more beneficial probably to us in terms of you know the feedback and to the person that's calling as well. So, and I knew that this was on the table, so I wanted to know where we were with it, so I could tell people here's where we are with it. We try and do the best we can. At least, like now, we're getting a lot of calls coming in where people want grass cut. Mm -hmm. And two things: one is staffing level, and the other is the weather. So they're calling in. It's we want to do it, but to have the manpower and have the weather cooperate, uh, it just isn't happening as well as anybody would like. And so people think their calls aren't being answered. It doesn't mean that we don't want to do it, and we're not aware of it. So, again, what I'll call that fine balancing act. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Anything else? Okay. Uh, motion to adjourn. Second. It's, oh, it's, it's Marion and Vince. Oh, Marion and Vince. Oh, sorry. I'll, I'll move, take move to adjourn. Adjourn? Give me a second. Second. Adjourn. Okay. But we're adjourned. We okay, have call to order city development and planning. Um, accept properties from Sura. This is the other side of the transaction. The same 12 properties. Accept them so that the city can then sell them. You either approve or will may approve the sales tonight in the executive session. This meeting. Okay. So, any motion to move? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. <coughs> Uh, Nykirk resolution, Mr. Mayor McCarthy. Uh, Nykirk is celebrating its 600th anniversary this year. There is a uh, ceremony at the end of this month. We're going from Schenectady to Nykirk, We're just looking for a ceremonial resolution on behalf of the council, uh, acknowledging the, uh, the long history between the two cities. Great. Motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Um, and I'm looking for a ceremonial resolution just in appreciation of the Union College students that did the Before I Die board. It's taking off on Facebook and it really is wonderful. I mean, the other day there was 
before I die, I want to meet Steve Urkel, before I die, <laughs> just all these really random, and then wonderful things, like I want to buy a house for my children and I to live in, and, and it's just, it was, I've seen absolutely no, nothing negative on it, it's just really, it's, it's a very, it's a very neat project, so I would just like to, um, you know, the, the very, uh, a uni college senior that really spearheaded the entire thing and saw it all the way through, and she worked for months and months. So, I'll move it. okay, I second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Excellent. Uh, DSIC cricket, Ms. Porterfield. Yes. Um, I wanted to bring up. We got um, some correspondence from the folks who play cricket at, or assigned to play cricket at. Um, thank you. At the uh, Park Field, and basically that. There wasn't enough room to play in that field. And we're looking for, for opportunities to play in other fields, specifically requesting Central Park and, um, and Mount Pleasant. And um, I thought that well, somebody would be here from, um, from OGS, but they were told that um, those that opportunity wasn't available because of previous problems. And so we received an email saying, you know, we addressed these previous problems, and here's how, we, how we'd like to rectify that because we don't have enough room to play in, in just Grout Park because of the number of teams that there are and the number of organizations who are sharing that park, which is three. So, um, you know, I'm bringing this back for discussion to see if there's something we can do to accommodate, even if it's on a probationary period where we say, well, you know, you have to meet all the conditions, whatever the, those conditions are, and um, should those conditions not be met, then you can no longer play in these parks. Um, you know, it's, I, I think that there's actually, you know, cricket's it's a pretty good sport, it's an international sport, and I don't know if there's any other cities in the capital region that could say that, hey, we have cricket teams here. And um, so, uh, about, hey, beg your pardon? No, I said such a yeah. large group of people. Yeah, and uh, so, you know, it's really a selling point for the city. Maybe it needs some tweaking and some um, and some things well, worked out. In the uh, council it designated Grout Park as his primary field. Uh, thought everybody was working together. There has been uh, what call less than uh, optimal negotiations there. Uh, I still haven't looked at the general outline in terms of how many fields they can get on site at Grout Park and said that we would make some of the city crews available uh, to help facilitate the layout of additional cricket fields. Again, if the uh, site works there, we've been backed up uh, in with tornado weather and other things. Wanted to clear that tree line along uh, Altamont Avenue, not Altamont, at Hamburg Street and get the site cleaned up again so that it would have higher utilization. The problem in Central Park is really not being scheduled for softball so that some of that space is not available. We have problems with the A-diamond where there's a deteriorated point where it's really hazardous and we have liability issues uh, on that field to play. So again, it becomes this balancing act of trying to get everybody uh, scheduled, get them in there. And when we did this uh, last summer, really thought that Brown Park was going to be the center of the cricket activity here in the community. And, and I think, John, did you want to speak to that at all? Um, I think that was the, the idea, but as they after they got there, they realized that there's just not enough room for everyone in all the games that um, they're playing. Well, that's true, because what happened there, they're playing hardball. When the hardball is playing, they cannot utilize the field for any other activities. Because of the hardball, it's dangerous to be on the field playing on the games. There's only a two field for softball at any given time. And every Sunday, hardball is being utilized on the field. And that's the reason why they're asking <coughs> Continue to use Central Park and Mount Pleasant for softball. Sorry. Yes. So, oh. I mean, to me, it sounds it sounds like uh, sorry. <laughs> I mean, if it's hardball it takes up a larger space than the softball, right? I mean, just in terms of overlapping utilization, right? So, there's the other places that had been utilized in the past. Are there other people using that now? 
other groups using that, or is it still available? From Central, from Park, Central Park is being, has been scheduled for softball and other games. Baseball, so softball, not cricket. Right, correct. Right. Uh, and, that, and the other thing is, my understanding of the Mount Pleasant field, I'm not quite sure what is the city's and what is actually the school district. There's a, a line there that's never really been clearly delineated right. I mean, to where they play. My thought is if it's Mount Pleasant, if there's a question of where the line is, we should be able to give approval to at least use our half, you know, whatever part is ours, we've got approval. If they need to get approval from the school to use the other half, then so be it. But I mean, for us to block anybody from our half of it, I think is, you know, not necessarily good for the, the citizens who want to utilize it. And I think that in terms of the Central Park, you got two different organizations who want the same piece of real estate. How do we decide who gets it and who doesn't? And so, um, that's another concern of mine. Is it, but again, we, so it names to manage, becomes managing that site where again, <coughs> some of the council members were more directly involved in the negotiation of that where they were going to work among themselves in terms of the scheduling. That level of camaraderie it seems to have dissipated and you don't have some of the inherent flexibility that you might have right. to <coughs> again, get the utilization up at that field and have the activities where more of the infrastructure to support a cricket facility uh, is there and to make it work on the, the one field as opposed to diluting it, putting it in several sites where you could have really a, uh, a first class operation with Grout Park. It's not going to happen over one year, but as you build it, uh, you get that, that really becomes a regional draw. Right. I think moving them all to Grout Park before the park is ready to handle such a large number of people, uh, it maybe is not necessarily the right strategy. I mean, I think eventually if we got the land, you could lay out, you know, I think on a given Saturday, there's probably five people that want to, five different teams that want to play at the same time. And so uh, if you could fit three of them in Grout Park with modification, great, but there's still more people. So um, I, I think we need to have a lottery system for the Central Park and the Mount Pleasant areas and, uh, and allow, first of all, allow it to be played at Mount Pleasant, at least on the property that we own. And if they can squeeze in there and play it, great. And, and uh, in Central Park, I think there needs to be a lottery system. I mean, we've got to keep it there. And, and to say that, no, you can't, and then say yes to some other group, but I, I don't necessarily think We may be able to work on, Jeremy's uh, here, the, we may be able to do that on Mount Pleasant. I'm not sure you're going to have the option in Central Park. Okay. Right, so that'd, that'd be good. I mean, if we can figure out a way to get Mount Pleasant back up and running, I think we'd have some happier people. Yeah, yeah I feel pretty strongly about it too. Um, you know, it's it's a it's a positive thing. It's a good thing. It's a bonding thing. And um, if we have the provision to add some space so that more people can play, I think we should do that. Right. <laughs> you know. And I, you know, see, I, I don't kind of, I don't remember the Grout Park conversation quite the same. I know that we s said, yes, utilize Grout Park. They were going to make the, um, they were going to make the improvements. They were going to open it up to anyone's use and all that. But I didn't think that was at the demise of the other wickets, I think. Yeah. I, I kind of followed the same. Right, so, and, and I'm not sure they understood that either. So if we have space in Mount Pleasant that's not being utilized, that we could add one or two wickets to, if we can't do Central Park, well, everybody's got to compromise here. You know what I mean? Because we have, we have other sports that like to be played too. But right now, I think they are really landlocked, and I think that their, their requests are reasonable, and I'd like to at least meet them part way. Um, and I would also like to take note of their agreement and what they're willing to do um, for us to expand the amount of cricket that's played in the city. And I think that that's an important part too. Because I know, and, and I said this at the council meeting, I fielded complaints for loud music and smoking and profanity and different things, which comes with a group of people getting together, especially in a competitive situation. 
So, <clears throat> you know, I think that part of it needs to be taken into consideration too. And I think, you know, maybe the Mount Pleasant is on a, you know, a, a, a temporary basis and we see how it goes and if everybody lives up to their part, which is fair from the other side, I think. Yeah, I would say so too. You take a look at if there were any complaints that came in. Because there were a lot of complaints last year. And that's really yeah. the bottom line of this whole thing. So if the um, association is willing to take those complaints seriously, um, there shouldn't be a problem. And if they're not taking them seriously, then it's not going to work and yep. will at least know. Um, and they did address those complaints in their, in their correspondence to us. They may have addressed them in their correspondence, but when you get out there playing is really when the neighbors have issues with some of the things that are going on. And that's really the crux of the whole matter was the residents that lived around um, the playing area of Mount Pleasant were disturbed by some of the things that were going on. And, you know, they have a right to voice their opinion as well. Absolutely. And the association has a right to improve. So, sure. You know? Yeah. Learning, learning for everybody. Yep. Learning for everybody. Okay. So, and, and yep. Go ahead. question. So, with, with the, the Grant Park, so that um, contract is all signed and, and sealed delivered. So, that's no, we're still, we, we have final draft waiting for them to sign it. I understand once they agreed at the end of last year, the first part of this year, to a version got bogged down and so the contract is not been signed. Okay. I'm fine. So waiting for the group? The best of my knowledge, uh, I think it was Carl that drew the last uh, version and I'm under the impression that we're waiting for the response, but I will cool. check on that. Maybe we could follow up if, if yeah. somebody could just call them and say we're waiting for your signature because then the conversations I've had, granted, not with every participant, but um, it didn't sound like they knew they were being waited on. I think they would have signed. Okay. So, so maybe it's just a communication out. gap and, and you can figure that out. That's the easy solution. Mr. Uh, I, um I guess my only concern is who, if this goes into a probationary period, because as Mrs. Brooker brought out, there was problems there. There's people on Norwood and Pennsylvania Avenue were not happy. So who's going to have the final say when all said and done? Is this going to be a 30-day interim or a two-month interim period, and then a decision will be made? Or who's going to have the say on it? Is it going to be the council? Is it going to be the parks department, the mayor? I mean, we could say that it will be a probationary period, but at the end of the probationary period, then we look at if there was any complaints, if they were addressed or not. Last year, we had gone to a point where it was week to week where some of the performance was, in my mind, not acceptable and in fact we tolerated more than we probably should have. Because I understand flag football is not allowed anymore because of the problems they had. That's, that's what my understanding. So um, there's issues there. Naturally, we have to be sensitive to the neighborhood. They're the people that are living there, so they should have some kind of... Uh, and, it's say, other, and, and it's other people that are using the park simultaneously. Right. So as long as it's under control, they have a, a thing to grieve their problems to, or a, a board to grieve their problems to, we'll see how it goes. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by a board to grieve their problems to. Well, most of it comes up and I've got to decide. Well, then you're the board. <laughs> <laughs> That's my question. Who's going to make the decision? That's my question. Absent the council taking some directive, it's like anything else. It's, uh, well, the directive is we get the phone calls with the complaints. Right. Then we saw it goes to you. It's and myself, it's the command staff of the police department or the fire department who's dealing with an incident that is, you know, somebody's engaged in behavior that's just unacceptable. Right. So I, I How think, about this? We keep the lines of communication open and we talk about it. If, all the calls are coming to me you, anyhow because we don't have the call right. log. It, right, that's <laughs> right. If we're experiencing <laughs> calls, <laughs> then it goes on the agenda and we discuss it. You know, no matter who's experiencing the calls, get it on the agenda and we discuss it. Great. Mr. Erickson? No, I, I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Okay, very good. And I understand this last item is for executive session, so I ask for a motion to recess city development and planning. So we'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, 
called to order health and recreation. Um, Proctor's open container waiver. Right, so um, let's see. It's in your package. Uh, PAC Proctor's is going to be hosting a bear truck on the corner of State and J on July 19th. And then also they're going to have the circus uh, July 18th and 21st. And we'll also be hosting a bear truck and is asking for um, the open container waiver so that uh, they're allowed to to host those trucks. Excellent. I'll move. I need a second. Yes. Mr. Brady? I'm sorry. Yep, yep. Okay. No, sorry. All, all those in favor? Aye. Uh, anything else to be coming for health and rec? I move we adjourn. Okay. Second. Oh, yeah, I do have oh. one. Yeah, oh. this is actually for Mr. Polster. I get a call um, from your office actually uh, for the the for the dog park committee. Did we make a decision at the last meeting whether we're going to go with TNA with trust 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 an agency trust an agency or the committee? And you know we're I thought they were supposed to come Hopefully. back to us. Yeah. Um, I haven't heard anything back, so I will check on that. <clears throat> okay. Thank you. you know. Thank you. I'll understand the motion to I will move to so adjourn. All those in favor? Aye. 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 We're adjourned. Okay, a call to order public safety. Chief Del Rocco, there's a resolution for Chief Doherty. Thank you. Uh, this is uh, basically a ceremonial resolution as well. Uh, Mayor McCarthy received uh, notification from the National Fire Academy of uh, Deputy Chief Doherty's uh, completion of the Executive Fire Officer Program at the National Fire Academy. This is a very prestigious um, accomplishment. Uh, Deputy Chief Doherty will be the first firefighter in Schenectady Fire Department to have completed this program. Uh, it sets a fine example for our younger firefighters and there's a great deal in the uh, fire, of discussion in the fire service today about higher education and leadership training for our fire officers and firefighters as they uh, proceed through the ranks. So, uh, as I said, this sets a very good example, and so I'm just requesting uh, a resolution for the council um, to right. recognize Deputy Chief Doherty's efforts and accomplishments. I would be proud to look at it. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Is that in favor? Aye. I'd also like to present to him the actual certificate at that council meeting sure. as opposed to uh, give it to a less formal setting. Great. Okay. Uh, if there's nothing else to come before public safety, move and adjourn. So moved. Uh, Second. All those in favor? Aye. Call to order public service and utility, uh, water department supplies, Mr. LeFong. Good evening. This is the legislation for both tonight is for the requirement of um, supplies and equipment we purchase every year uh, for the water department. It includes any work from valves, couplings, clamps, uh, everything we need in our distribution system, including hydrants that we replace on an annual basis, either from traffic accidents or just based on age. Some of the older ones that just don't have parts for that we uh, have standardized to a different um, breakaway hydrant. Uh, it's annual, we do it every year. Um, there are four bidders. We award based on low price for particular items. So out of the four bidders, they're all going to get something, but it was based on the price of the manufacturer. So it's, you know, everybody has a little bit of something that they were low in price with, and that's how we award it. It went through bid net, and a number of people who looked at it at the bid net, the four major suppliers. Okay. Um, yeah, I do have one question. Is this, does this is drinking water as well as? This, this is all drinking water. This is for the distribution system. Um, I know that um, in January 2014, there's, there's supposed to be a change in the amount of lead that they can yes. have in there. This is all we suspect for no lead. Okay. They had to provide us with a document that they had to meet the no lead requirement. This stuff will go on the show. We are, we are allowed to use some of the lead products. I think it's till June, but after that, that's the product. It can't be used any longer. So anything we have coming in this order is like Okay, that was my question. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I guess, 
how much does that add to the cost? Well, not that there's anything, it doesn't add a lot to the cost. Because I know going to the plumbing store now when you buy lead free. Yeah, it does add a little bit more to the cost because everything is now lead free. The valves that we put in the ground, there's no tons of lead in them. Um, and again, now even for you know, homeowners, anything you use now, yeah. lead free, completely lead free. Is it stainless? Or what? No, it's just lead free. You get lead free. There's lead in a lot of different homes. There's right. some lead in covers or lead in, in the solder you use. Um, but the, the goal is to be completely lead free by um, January 14th as the rule comes to it. I'll move. Okay. Second. 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 All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else to come before public service and utilities? Move so we adjourn. We have a second. Mr. Reed. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We're adjourned. A call, call to order government operations. Not sure if this first item needs to be an executive session or not, but you know, we've been having some feedback on the at the council meetings about the lot located at 108 Brandywine Avenue, and the council really isn't familiar with what's going on there, what type of discussions have been had about the utilization of it, if there have been any bids, you know, we haven't nothing has come before the council. So because it's a bid, I don't know if that's negotiations and needs to go into executive session, but I do think we need to know the current activity with regard to that lot and what the thought process of the city is. If you're going to be discussing potential contract negotiations, it should be in executive session. Okay. Yes, Mr. Erickson? I guess outside of any contracts or offers to buy, um, you know, my opinion that you know, the city should offer the lot to, you know, the organization who is using as parking under a condition that they maintain the facility of the property and whether it's a, a rent or whether it's an agreement or, you know, I'm open to things, but I think there's a religious institution nearby that uses it. It would be beneficial, help them just in the street. And I think that if we could open it uh, to them, at least until we figure out what we're doing here, it's not a guarantee that the lots could be available forever. It's not a guarantee. You know, it's not a guarantee past you know the next day, but I think since it's there and available to keep it blocked off, um, it might be just poor taste if if the organization is willing to make sure that it's returned in good condition, clean condition uh, after the use. So. And if we have to have something towed out of there, we we'll make additional revenue potentially yeah. if the towing fees are <laughs> exactly. right. Yes, Mr. Porterfield. Um, yeah, in addition, I agree with that. In addition to that, um, just for you know, for information's sake, the um, the um, Muslim faith is getting ready to enter into Ramadan pretty soon, which means a lot of people will be coming to the mosque, and so there's going to be a lot of parking in the neighborhood. And we know that when there's a lot of parking in the neighborhood, sometimes we get complaints from the neighbors because you used my parking space, all, all kinds of things. So. Um, I, I agree that we should, you know, take a look at doing that, and that would solve a couple of concerns even before they happen. So. so, do we need to do anything official, or do we just ask the administration to open the gate, or? What's, what's you're getting to the point where you're talking contract negotiations. Right now. Should be I would okay. assume that there's some liability things that Mr. Polster would want to make us aware of. I think, you know, I, I, I agree that that seems like a logical way to go, but we'll, as we'll learn the city's uh, portion of it in executive session. So, um, call for public hearing, management benefits. Mr. Palatico is not here, Mayor. The, uh, we'll call it pattern contract that the council approved we entered into with, uh, 1037. Uh, we would like to do that with management. Uh, some of the management benefits reference the CSEA contract. So what I'm looking to do is break that away from the CSEA and go back to uh, a management package that is separate, distinct, and really reflects the agreement that we entered into with uh, 1037 so that we could move forward uh, with the management employees under those terms and conditions we generally essentially discussed before. So the management package would mirror what we've asked our unions to agree to though? Uh, what 1037 has agreed to and what we are still negotiating with the other unions to agree to. Okay. 
Okay. CSEA has not agreed to it, even though I think there's another session scheduled for the morning. So I think a level playing field is Correct. very fair here. Mr. Erickson, did you have a question? Yeah. So, I mean, is, will it, going forward, will it be tied to the other union, or will it be more of a, you know, we're just going to state what it is and be, be, more, be separate, be separate. Yeah. So, so it won't, it won't be tied to going forward, just tying it here and then tying right, it here. Right now, it references the CSEA agreement. It would go back to really the sole prerogative of the city council. Okay. And would this be all management or just certain management? I know we it was a year or two ago we talked about I think police and fire management being different. Than this is uh, referring to non public safety management. Okay. Is there a reason we wouldn't tie public safety into it? Or? We could do that except some of it is now referenced in the other agreements with the police and the fire. And not at this point is we are not to bring them into the fold with the rest of the management. Correct. Other questions? Okay, can I I'm looking for a motion? It's not my like proposal at this point, something that I'll look at. I mean, look at but do you think it would be problematic to have two different tiers of management at this point? I mean, some managers will have one set of benefits and another manager will have a different set of benefits? I mean, it is, no. you know, I mean to me it would seem it's the nature of negotiations in New York State where we have binding arbitration as a component public safety negotiations, you are going to have a separate set of benefits that apply to those employees governed by that. Those that are not probably have to give them a different set of benefits, which they do now. They're all covered under binding arbitration? No. Police and fire are covered under binding arbitration. The management is to everybody else. Command staff of the police and fire department are reflected in those contracts that are put in place for their subordinate employees. Chief and deputy chiefs and assistant chiefs and commissioners, they're not, though, right? Commissioner is an exception, but the chief's chief is. Right. Okay. I, thought, I, thought we, I thought we did something a year ago. Well, we, did, we did change some of that. We brought it back in. In the fire department, you have one employee. Deputy chiefs there are covered. The fire or the police department, the assistant chiefs, and the chief are not their management employees. But we took and shifted that so that they weren't getting the huge payouts. We adjusted some of the salary. So again, the salary reflected the rank. We had that salary compression where the subordinates were getting pay raises, the management wasn't, so that the incentive to become a command officer just was not there. And this is called a public hearing anyway, so this is still open for public hearing. Because it's changing the code. <coughs> Would we have the published, what the terms of the proposed contract proposal? Uh, proposed yes, benefit. and I thought Mr. Felatico was going to have that. This is the call for the public hearing. We have time to get to do that. And again, somewhat of a dynamic process where we have, <coughs> I believe tomorrow morning, in another negotiating session with CSEA. Okay. And miraculously agree to everything tomorrow and make this whole thing. I'm sure they will. A little, a little more interesting. I'm, I'm sure they will. Smooth. Okay. All right, thanks. Okay, so I'm looking for a motion to call for a public hearing for so management second. <coughs> I will second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. And fee for public assembly inspections, Mr. Salomon. Handouts. I apologize for being late. Um, in the packet, you have uh, the legislative request, which has most of the specifics in it, but I'm giving you legislation now that's actually much clearer. Regulations put out by the New York State Department of State, 
as well as uh, as part of the building code of the state of New York. Uh, the city of Schenectady is required to make certain public uh, assembly inspections. Uh, and basically, the city of Schenectady is, is required to inspect every place where the public may assemble, such as restaurants, bars, stores, movie theaters, uh, proctors, uh, every year. Uh, and the city of Schenectady is required to inspect uh, motels, hotels, and the like every three years. Uh, currently, the city of Schenectady does not charge for these inspections, um, and you know, many municipalities throughout the state of New York do. Um, with speaking with Eric Schilling, it's come to our attention that one of our code enforcement officers spends up to a third of the year doing nothing but these inspections, uh, which is obviously uh, quite costly to the city. Um, so we've, we've made a proposal um, to uh, begin charging a, a fee for these services. Um, and that's what you guys held a public hearing on last week. I don't believe anyone spoke on it. Um, and just real quick, going to the, the legislation, the first part just discusses where the regulations come from from the state that mandate we do this. Uh, second chapter says that you know the code for the building inspector has to designate. That's supposed to be building code enforcement officer. I apologize for the typo. Um, that, that it's someone that's qualified to do the inspections. Um, that the inspections will be done according to New York State regulations. Uh, that will provide a certificate of inspection every year. And then it lays out the fees. And the fees for a building up to 2,500 square feet and an occupancy of less than 20 people is $75. Um, a building uh, less, at least 2,500 square feet but less than or equal to 10,000 square feet or an occupancy of at least 20 but less than 250 people is $125. And for buildings greater than 10,000 square feet or an occupancy greater than 250 people is $250. And that last one is, is much different than what most municipalities do. Because what most municipalities do is they say that that greater um, becomes the you know, higher fee than the previous um, you know, level on the scale, plus some fee for every square foot above that. Um, and that obviously would get quite expensive for you know, book high or, or proctors um, or even some of the hotels. So we're not doing that. We're obviously we're not we're not, and we cannot, uh, you know, seek to make money on this. This is solely for, you know, what the cost of the service provided is. Um, you know, it's another unfunded mandate uh, provided by the state. We have to do something to, you know, to pay for it, to offset that. So do you guys have any questions? Questions, Mr. Erickson? So on the different three different sizes, or you know, instead of those online. Do we have any estimates of you know quantities that we currently do? I mean, how many of small, medium, largest are there? Well, I believe Eric has has an outline, but what I can tell you is from a you know I'm, I'm not sure if this is sufficient to you, but um, you know, high you know going from as high level as possible, I can tell you that this year, if this funding was if this charge was in place, it would have been somewhere between ten to fifteen thousand dollars. Um, and this is the same question I asked before. Does this include churches and it religious does. organizations? It does. It does. Okay. And most, most municipalities throughout, the, all municipalities that charge, they have to charge. Um, this isn't um, a tax where you have a tax exemption. This mm -hmm. would be similar to water, sewer, the types of fees that um, a tax exemption does not apply to. Um, so, you know, so that's how that, that works. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Erickson. So if it's fifteen thousand dollars, still doesn't pay for three quarters of a year of an employee. It's right? one third. One oh one third. One third. Okay, so that's one third of his pay. You know, whether it actually at the end of the day, when you compute out what his benefits are, you know, I mean, whether it's exactly one third, whether right, no, it's exactly yeah, yeah. one third of his time. Close. It's, just it's a it's a lot. Definitely so close. Is what we're at now. Zero. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. I mean, and the other side is obviously. You know, we want to do we want to do something to to offset our cost, but we also don't want to be you know here's a ridiculous high fee. Right. You know, I think it seems to be within normal reasonability. Okay. Sure. okay. Thank you. So I look for a motion to accept this. So moved. Okay. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Very good. Um, if there's nothing else to come before government operations, I'll ask for a motion to recess. Just a quick one. The other goal becomes uh, re 
reducing insurance costs. We you do these inspections. We've had uh, some very serious fires here in the community, but we're being more aggressive. Hopefully, we can put some of that behind us, and over the long term, we'll reduce the incident of event, and people will see their uh, homeowners' uh, commercial insurance rates decline. That doesn't happen quickly, but again, it's a long-term trend, and uh, we're laying the groundwork for those things to happen, both in the, the housing stock and the commercial process. I'll move we recess. recess. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Take hold order claims. We'll discuss the two recessed committees and everything on claims. This is all executive session, Mr. Polster? Yes, yes, it is. A motion to go into executive session. So moved. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Executive session.